here's, I, I'm a patsy, I'll tell you, I'm a sucker for the dream world. You know, I still figure that I'm on the yellow brick road. And I'm walking through the poppy fields, you know, with the cowardly lion. In fact, I work for the cowardly lion. You know, or is it the, is it the scarecrow? And I, I always figure that one day I'm going to get to the Emerald City, see. Well, the other day I saw that commercial on TV. And, you know, for years I've been fighting the shaving bit. I remember the first time. How many of you guys, seriously, remember the first time you shaved? There had to be a first time. Absolutely, the first minute you stood in front of the sink. You were looking for your hair. <laughs> you know it was here last month. You know, you finally find it, see? You got this big date with Esther Jane. And you know that any time that the old man has got a big thing coming up, he shaves. And he stands up. In fact, I learned my basic language <laughs> from listening to my old man in the John shaving. Either that or driving his olds. I mean, I, I, I know some guys, believe me, I know all kinds of artists. I don't think we really recognize true folk art. We think folk art is playing a guitar, you know, and singing about. You know, I was walking down the railroad. You know, some kid from CCNY. <laughs> with, a, with a master's, you know, in business administration. And he dreams that he's in a bread line. <laughs> building, building the Union Pacific. <laughs> in the year 1931, you know. And he says, I was walking down the railroad. Working for just four cents a day. What dreams? That's not a folk artist. <laughs> not at all. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's as authentic, believe me, as the guy who used to play the organ at the Orpheum Theater. When I was a kid, he had this great big organ that said Wurlitzer all over the side of it, you know, in, in little red and pink sequins. And he would come up out of the ground and up on the screen it would say, sing along. Sing along and watch the words as the ball bounces. And he would go, da 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 And he would turn and he had these teeth that lit up. <laughs> that wavy hair, you know. And he had this white coat, all of us kids sitting back there, you know, waiting for, waiting for Roy Rogers to show up. And this guy would show up. You know. And, and on, on the screen would come this song. You'd see this picture of a landscape. They had slides. And there's a moon. And the sky is red. And you see these sailboats. And underneath it would say, Red sails in the sunset. And us kids would sit there. Look up at that. And this went on for weeks. Until Flick. <laughs> invented a series of our own special lyrics. <laughs> and boy, do I know some great lyrics now. I mean, I can sing you lyrics for Betty Coed. Talk about sickening stuff in your head. <laughs> Don't you ever wonder whether big guys like President, President Johnson have that stuff too? <laughs> whether he knows lyrics, you know, to the kind of stuff we do, you know. Oh, the monkey went on the head, I <laughs> Another music lover up there. <laughs> Listen, I sometimes, you know, it's so embarrassing, you know, when, when, you know, when people sing in the shower, I always sing Red Wing. <laughs> I wonder if any of you know the lyrics that I know to Red Wing. You save them for after the show, okay? <laughs> well, these are the kind of things, you know, that bug the common ordinary man. And so... From the very first day when you start shaving, I remember my old man in the next room. See, I'm a kid. And he's going out with my mother. And they've had their nightly fight. I mean, whenever they were going out, there was a fight. They were always going to somebody named Roy and Bernice Wheeler. <laughs> and they were always going to see Bernice, who had called that afternoon and said, why don't they come over to play bridge? And the instant the old man would hear that, 
He'd come into the kitchen, and my mother would say, she'd say, how about, I've got a surprise tonight. The old man has already got his clothes at half mast. The instant he would hit the kitchen, you know, off would come the coat, you know, the pants, and he'd be in his BVD, you know, with the buttons flying. And she would catch him just as he's opening up the refrigerator to grab his first three bottles of beer. You know, he's back from a rotten day at the office. My mother would say, I have a surprise. And he would turn around with that menace. And me and my kid brother sitting at the kitchen table, we knew what the surprise was. We had already been alerted. For the last two hours, my kid brother had been crying under the daybed. Oh, how many of you remember those awful evenings when you had to go and visit people like Roy and Bernice, who had no kids and had false teeth? And they had three, three birds named Budgie. And, and the instant you would come in, you know, and they had all these things about, they would say, you, they insisted on you calling them Uncle Roy and Aunt Bernice. And my mother would say, kiss Aunt Bernice. I wonder how many budding novelists were born. You wonder how many guys you know were born at that minute? Kiss Aunt Bernice. And Aunt Bernice's face would approach you. And you could see her, her Sears Roebuck teeth gleaming. Aunt Bernice. And she always vaguely smelled like, I couldn't figure it out, like shaving cream. And Aunt Bernice would approach you, and then, then she would kiss you this big smacker on the, you know, right on it. She'd say, now kiss me. And your mother would say, she's standing there, she's like, you go, okay. <laughs> and she said, no, you're not. And then you go. She just wasn't that fun. And then Uncle Roy comes in. Uncle Roy has got on his new suit, you know. It's made out of sandpaper. <laughs> Yeah, there's a certain kind of Midwestern workman whose clothes are always made out of some kind of a gray material that squeaks. You know, they wear it, and they, they have their hair cut very short in the back, and it's always red, their neck, and that's Uncle Roy. Uncle Roy would come in, he'd say, Well, how are you, kids? He had this thing going with him, see, that all kids liked him. I wonder how many poor idiots sitting in this crowd think that the kids have a special affinity for them because not one has yet shot you. <laughs> no, it's all kinds of men have this. And so Uncle Roy and Aunt Bernice would be sitting there at their kitchen table and they've got out the cards and the old man is, Bagoo. this is the kind of night that he really hated. He'd sit down at the table and all of a sudden Aunt Bernice would say, it was like a litany. She would say, Oh, kids, would you two kids like a surprise? <laughs> My kid brother goes, <laughs> <laughs> My mother would say, shh, 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 shh. Yeah. Her surprise was always the same. She would go to the kitchen cupboard and open it up, and there would be their glasses. You know the glasses that ordinary working people, I'm talking about walking around spitting people, have in their, in their, you know, in their cupboards? You know, the, the, the glasses that say Peter Pan peanut butter on them? <laughs> you know, Aunt Jane's strawberry preserves, these are the stuff you drink out of, see? She would open up that, and in, in this cupboard would be a big glass bowl with a top on it, you know, in these glass jars. And she would say, how would you like a cookie? <laughs> I don't know where they get this idea that kids always want a cookie. And she had the same cookies ever since she had just gotten married. The same cookies were in there. They were these rubber Nabiscos. 
I mean, there's nothing worse than a 17-year-old Nabisco. And she'd open it up. Neither Roy nor Bernice ate cookies. And so she would open up the jar and say, here, pick one. You don't want to spoil your dinner. We're going to have Din Din afterwards. Out would come the rubber, the old rubber Nabisco. I'd hold it in my hand. And she'd say, isn't that good? Now, go into the next room and play. And instantly, me and my kid brother would go into the next room. See, they had this, they had this living room that was paved entirely with linoleum. I, mean, I, I grew up among linoleum people. In fact, our house was paved from one end to the other. You could roller skate through the whole house. <laughs> I mean, really, we had this blue and white linoleum, and my mother, every Saturday morning, would just hose it down, you know. <laughs> I mean, we had kids, you know, my kid brother would throw up under the radiator. She just held it. <laughs> Dogs would come through, and Bruner, and all the crowd. And so we would go into the next room. Now, we all, each one of us kids, I, 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 you know, I might tell you that I know that every human being that I've ever met has got one thing way down deep in his head, that one thing that bugs his conscience, the one terrible thing that he did, usually regularly. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of... Oh, yes, listen, I had a fantastic library, for example, that I kept down in the coal bin. <laughs> you know, my old man was reading uh, Popular Mechanics, you know, National Geographic, and I'm down in the basement with my books. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, and, and up upstairs in my bedroom, I had this bookshelf, you know, filled with what I was passing off to the rest of the world as my favorite books. <laughs> Raggedy Ann and Andy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Treasure Island. I mean, did you ever really read Treasure Island? You know? <laughs> Another victim of literature. Oh, yeah, that kind of stuff. I'll never forget the time my Aunt Glenn gave me for Christmas a copy of Silas Marner. And a pair of bunny slippers. <laughs> I mean, you know, these pink bunny slippers with the two little eyes. <laughs> I'm walking around, you know. And the one fear I had would be that Schwartz would find out about it. <laughs> you know, I'd be caught with my bunny slippers on, you know. I can imagine what that would have done, you know, the Warren G. Hardy. Gene Shepard wears bunny slippers. <laughs> Yeah, and so each one of us had our own little vices. Well, me and my kid brother had this, you might say, corporate vice. We would get into that, that, that living room, and Bernice and <laughs> Bernice and her husband would be in the next room. My mother and father would be starting to shuffle the cards. My kid brother has got his rubber Nabisco. I got my rubber Nabisco, and we would go over to the hot air register. <laughs> then this hot air register down here, see? And my kid brother would, he'd take his rubber Nabisco, see, and there's, there's a few symbolic bites on it. He'd chew it in front of her a little bit, you know. And now he sneaks up, stuffs it down. <laughs> then I would, you know, I'd take mine, I'd stuff it down there. Well, I want to tell you this. We visited Aunt Bernice. We visited them from the time I was seven, well up through my junior year. And every time we visited those two, we would get the rubber Nabiscos. And I'll never forget the day <laughs> in midwinter, I came home from school. You know, you know, you come home from school, you know, just like, you know, you've been out making a scene, you know, yelling and hollering, throwing rocks, kicking people, you know. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yeah, you know, I come home from school, you know, I've got this thing, you know, I'm, I'm 16 years old, I'm beginning to, you know, I'm really on top of it. And I walk up to the refrigerator and I slam the door open, I grab the peanut butter, and I hear out of the next room my mother say, Gene! She never called me Gene. Unless it was B-A-D-N-E-W-S. Now what? You know, oh, what, now what? I'd say, yeah. And she'd say, you don't leave this house until I talk to you. I said, but Schwartz and Flick and Brewer are out there. We're going to the pool room. She'd say, you wait here until I talk to you. And she's on the phone. And she comes out of the bedroom. Now, all of us have this secret feeling. Inside, way deep inside, that one day we are going to be discovered. I wonder how many guys walking along Fifth Avenue every time they see a cop. I mean, they have not ever done anything bad in their life. They see a cop and they say, they can't blame that one on me. <laughs> I mean, don't you ever have that good feeling when you read the post? And on page three it says, axe murder slays 26 in Pitcairn, Pennsylvania. And you say, I wasn't there. <laughs> they ain't gonna pin that one on me, boy. I was in Teaneck. I didn't do that one. You, you get this feeling of, oh boy. Wow. Well, I just wonder how many guys walking along, I mean, Fifth Avenue, Sixth Avenue, any one of the big Manhattan streets have this feeling that any minute now, a big, heavy hand is gonna lay down on their shoulder and he's simply going to say, all right, let's go. <laughs> and you'll go. Just say, it's all over. We know all. You say, oh, I knew it. <laughs> I knew you'd find out. Well, we know. See, there's a thing. We're animals. We really are, you know. The animal, the one thing about animals, if you've ever done any fishing or hunting, any of this, you wonder how it is that animals know they really do. If you've ever seen a crow, I lived my whole adolescent life among crows. And the crows would walk along to school with you, you know? Yeah, you'd go to school with nine crows. And I'd go, ah, ah, ah. Oh, the crow, listen, if you think starlings are bad, a crow, believe me, not only tells dirty stories, he lives them. <laughs> Oh, a crow is a bad bird. I, I think one of the reasons we hate starlings. Have you noticed nobody mounts a campaign to rid the world of wrens? We love wrens. I've never known 4,000 people get together to clean out the robins. But starlings? Yeah. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the starling does not hop. You know how birds go like this? Starlings go like this. <laughs> You ever watch the starling? He's got knees. He wants to... I'm not kidding. They really do. And he's got a look in the eye. See? Oh, yeah. Many of... Uh, right now, at this minute, I'll guarantee you, in Darien, there are over 14,000 starlings hanging on to the clock in the courthouse amid all that plastic ivy that hangs down from the roof of that clock. Yeah. And, and they're yelling and hollering. It's, here it is. It's almost 11 o'clock. They're yelling and hollering like no good bird should be at this hour. And the good burgers are walking by there. And they get the suspicion that those starlings are up to no good. And they ain't. The starlings are doing it. We read novels about it. The starlings are doing it. And I'll tell you, nothing gets uh, the average man madder than to see a starling walking along <laughs> with a cigar butt. Oh, starlings look at chicks. <laughs> Sickening bird. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was uh, this blonde one day, and a, a starling followed us for over three blocks, <laughs> making, you know, remarks like, what are you doing that freak? Hey, hey, come on with me. I'm a real bird, boy. You know? oh, yeah. And so deep down inside of every one of us, we're like the animals. The starling has instincts. The turtle has instincts. 
We have instincts about evil. They have instincts about food and about the changing seasons. But each man, from the time he's born, and nobody can understand this, has an instinct when he is doing something bad. He knows it. Now, he may pretend and say, well, after all, everybody else is doing it. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, if there's anything that evil wants, it's company. Oh, yeah, oh, no, no doubt about it. I mean, I, I have been solicited by every type of criminal. Come on, let's go down and knock over the bank. Well, I don't want to go. Oh, come on, we're making up a party. Let's go. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a secret thing. And so I walk into the kitchen. You didn't think I'd get back, did you? <laughs> Let's hear it now. <laughs> You're dealing with a pro, gang. I know where I'm going, you know. I mean, even if where I'm going is bad, I know. By the way, have you ever had a secret feeling that one day you're going to land in heaven? And you don't believe in it? <laughs> that would be the ultimate put-down. <laughs> All of your life you were saying, I don't need none of them cheap superstitions. Why, that... Uh, something or other, something that's the opiate of the masses. I don't believe in that stuff. You know, and you're very hip, and all of a sudden, out of the darkness comes that Mack truck. You know, it's that moment of truth, and pow! You're spread eagle in the sky. Your briefcase is 30 feet in the air. You've been on your way to lunch, you know, heading to the chock full of nuts. And there goes your briefcase with all your important papers in it, your three Twinkies. That you've been saving for after lunch, you know, you're high up in it. And the next thing you know is blackness. And you're going down through this dark, swirling cavern. Whew. Whew. You're flying. And suddenly a bright light. And there you are. And here's this guy with a beard. And he's got a white robe on. And he's got wings. And you can see all these other guys playing harps. And you look up and you say, what are you trying to do? Put me on. I don't believe this jazz. And this great figure looks down and says, are you Charles Willoughby Applerot? <laughs> yeah. We have a list of your sins here. And the time has now come to pay. You mean to tell me that jazz is for real? You say, yeah, man, it is. It is for real in spades. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. All right, man, do your worst. Because every one of us secretly think that we are so rotten that we are going to wind up in hell. Well, everybody says, oh, yeah, I want to be where my friends are. How many times you've heard this? You know, everybody believes this, see? And St. Peter looks in this great big book and he opens it up. And he says, Charles, William B., Apple Rot, Apple Rot, Apple Rot, Apple Strudel, Apple Strumpson. <laughs> apple Rot. Well, it was that time, January 5th, 1946. You remember that? No. So, well, it was pretty good. <laughs> You got taste, man, anyway. <laughs> he goes down the list, you know, and you say, well, okay, I'll go where my buddies are. And then he comes out, he says, Charles Willoughby, Apple Rot, here are your wings. Gives you the wings. You look up and you say, what are you doing, Put me on? He says, no. You have lived an exemplary life. And then there's that terrible feeling of being cheated. <laughs> what were the rest of them doing? <laughs> I lost up again. Let's hear it. Come on, let's hear it. By the way, before... 
before we go any further, what do you say we give the news a big cheer? Let's go. Now, no, no, newsmen never get applauded. I mean, but it's got to come to that day. I mean, what are these two guys, Brunkley and Clinkley? Hunkley and Finkley? Oh, God, all right, ease, fella. You've had it. You've had it. All right, he's had his chance. By the way, I thought I told him about the center booth. <laughs> he just came out. And I know he wasn't making a phone call. However, you know, I'll tell you about this business of showbiz. I mean, it's got to happen since we've just applauded the news. You know, you get, you get, uh, what is, what are their names? Huntley, Clinkley, Clinkley, Funkley? Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's a man that's right got his finger on the pulse of what's happening. He could tell you, Crunkley, Crinkley, uh, Walter, Wa Walter Kiernan. No, no, uh, Walter Crunkley. Walter Crunklight. That's right, yeah. They all look the same. They got this earphone. <laughs> and they all look so calm. Have you noticed they always say the newscaster is always introduced by an announcer who says, and now here is the world's news with Walter Cronkite. And then you see a shot of Walter Cronkite. You know, he's always in the background before he comes on and he's talking to somebody. <laughs> you ever wondered what he's really saying? <laughs> you know, and then he takes a drink of his stuff, you know, and they say, and now with the news, here is Walter Cronkite. And he swings around and he says, good evening. <laughs> in Vietnam today and then he goes and it's so calm so controlled that no wonder 28 million people sitting out there in the darkness feel that the world is in good hands I mean between channel 4 and channel 2 there are three good men and they always look a little cynical about it if you notice What's his name, David? David always says, and that's what happened today in Washington. <laughs> oh, man, we used to have a word for that kind of guy. I mean, it was smart something. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's a three-letter word. I just can't think. And there was a word, there was a phrase that said he can't pour something out of a booth, I believe. Oh, gone it, I can't think of whatever. These things slip my mind. And these two, you know, they're, they've got everything under control. Can you imagine what would happen one night if the newscaster shows up and actually reacts to his news? You know? Here comes Walter Cronkite. They say, now, here he is with the news. Walter Cronkite. And ah, he, shows, he sits down and his coat is torn off. He says, you don't know what happened in Vietnam today. <laughs> and now, a word from Mercury. Huh? And the world out there would be scared. That's why I think most people today who are on TV are cool and collected. I always get this little feeling at the end of Huntley and Brinkley. Just once, David is going to look at the other side of the screen. He's going to say, Chet... And Chet's going to say, yes, David. <laughs> say, Chet, you're getting to be a pain in the you-know-what. <laughs> David says, well, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and that's the news. <laughs> and now the weather. Have you ever listened to Lyle Van? They always say, and now the human side of the news with Lyle Van. Wouldn't you like to hear the other side? Or just once, you know, this gorilla comes in, sits down and tears Lyle Van apart. Says, I want to get my side on one. You know, or they, or they give some guy from the mafia the chance to do the weather. At a weather, folks. But everything is so cool and collected on our world of showbiz, except in one area. Do you know, friends, that we are about in just... Well, it's just a little less than 50 minutes now. We are about to begin to celebrate another American holiday. 
I received in the news past Wednesday, you know, I got a big promotional brochure, and it said, you know, very official, from this big PR company. Must have spent $50 on the brochure alone, you know, seven colors, pictures, Sophia Lauren, the whole bit. And I opened this thing up, and it said, beginning this Sunday at midnight, an American week is instituted. An American week of total celebration. And I love holidays, you know. I read this thing, I got all excited, see. And it says, this week, beginning at Saturday night, midnight, we are celebrating, are you ready now, you're Americans, you can understand this, American Oral Hygiene Week. <laughs> Only Americans would think of that holiday. I mean, I can't think of the French. <laughs> or the Italians, you know? You know, can you imagine the Tyrol of Achrava, Farina? Which translated means the Italian shave under your arm week. <laughs> I mean, no, they walk around, you know, they sweat. You see them down in places like Sicily, you know. And it never would occur to them. Only Americans would celebrate this. And I read this, see? And I'm, I'm a really good American, you know. I got the same fears that everybody else. And I says, American Oral Hygiene Week. Gee, that's a good one. How am I going to celebrate? <laughs> well, let's see. I, I could brush my teeth. Well, I mean, I don't want to go all out. You know, I could brush my teeth. I could spit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, oral hygiene in Indiana comes like that. In fact, we used to give awards in third grade for actual spitting. Oh, yeah, I, we had a kid named, named Farkas, Al Farkas, in our class. Farkas sat up in the front of the room, and, and he was our res, resident J.D. <laughs> oh, yeah, every class, I mean, all the boys know this. I mean, I mean every guy in this, in this audience right here, now I can see, I can tell by the incidence of thick glasses in this audience that all of you at one time or another has fell victim to a Farkas or a Grover Dill in third grade. I mean, I don't know whether girls have bullies, but I'll tell you boys do. And we have Farkas. And Farkas's toady was Grover Dill. And the two of them would sit up in the front and Farkas would go like this. What? <laughs> And Miss Shields, Miss Shields was our second grade teacher, you know. She would know that Farkas was getting ready to unload. <laughs> and Farkas was about to make a statement about the major exports of Peru. <laughs> which Miss Shields was just telling us about. Farkas would go, Oink! And Bill would turn to him and say, give it to him. See, that's the true, that's the true role of the toady. He is Iago. Yeah, the toady, by the way, splits from the bully the minute the bully has gotten three lefts in the, in the mouth. He immediately switches to the guy that gave it to him. That's true toadyism. I mean, in, in, in big corporate industry, that's called a man who is adaptable. <laughs> They can adapt to changing conditions. <laughs> they put old Bullard down the air shaft, and the minute you see the air shaft yaw yawning for Bullard, and for years you've been clinging to Bullard's, you know, you've been clinging to his belt, going, dee, dee, dee. <laughs> yeah, real toe, he says, kiss me, kiss me, I love you, oh, 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 oh. Hit him, go ahead, hit them guys, come on, go on, go get him, oh boy, what a great guy you are. The minute he sees the air shaft, yawning for Bullard. Instantly his talons snap open and he immediately looks. He's like a bloodsucker. He looks for another bully. He's going around, see, like this. It's like that, what is that little fish that hangs onto the shark? That's a toady. Well, we had Grover Dill who was a toady. And Farkas was the bully. I mean, Farkas was 
Well, let's see. We were in second grade. Farkas was 30. <laughs> well, actually, 28, but he thought, you know, in his mind, he thought like a grizzled veteran of endless ring battles. And he saw the world as a series of conflicts that could be solved by hitting heads together. And he did it. And I can remember all of us standing out. Yeah, you know, the great moments. I, uh, this, is, this is a boy's world. I remember standing out on the playground, see? This is afternoon recess. All morning, Farkas has been sitting in class quiescent, like a volcano. He would sit there. And you could see his ears getting redder and redder. He was hungry for somebody to hit. And sitting next to him was Dill. And Dill kept going. And back in the back row, all of the guys that lived in that great rabble of life, are you aware that even in second grade classes there is a ghetto? <laughs> These are all the people whose names begin with S and lower. I mean, Chester Wisniewski, Zinsmeister. We were all back in that great rabble, me and Schwartz, all of us sitting back there, Helen Weathers. I mean, even the girls, you know, that are in the back there are second-rate girls. Helen used to wear her sheepskin overcoat in class. You know, and she had this sheepskin collar, you know, she'd sit back there and sweat. <laughs> and she was our resident girl. <laughs> now, the real girls were all up in front. I mean, girls like Esther Jane Allberry, <laughs> Eileen Akers, all those. <laughs> yeah, they were the real girls, and they always memorized every poem. <laughs> I mean, I, I can remember all the way through, I mean, all the way through high school, these, these, these same chicks bugged me. I mean, the instant Miss, uh, Miss Shields would say, I want you to memorize Old Ironside, three chicks would say, I tear her tattered ensign down, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, my, first, my first initiation into actual showbiz was spending all night with my mother one time, I mean, on, in, in a state of absolutely borderline hysteria. I have been assigned to learn old Ironsides. Have you ever learned a poem that's spelled O-M-E? A poem. Ooh, I used to hate this. There were two things I hated. Learning a poem and writing a theme. And I used to fake both. And by the way, how many of you learned about book reporting? Oh, listen, I could tell a fake book report every time I open up the Sunday edition of the New York Times. <laughs> I can instantly say, this slob has not even seen this damn book. <laughs> May I tell you, that in the New York Times review of my book, this guy says the one thing Shepard doesn't have, he does not realize that he needs a story. That's the one thing I got. No characters, but plenty of story. You know? I says, what did he read? Well, I don't know what he read. And as an old book report faker, I know how it's done. And, and you know, especially the front one. You know, the big front important ones, they're always, they're always reviewing a 17-volume opus, like uh, the Civil War, the Boer War, the War of the World in Transition by Bruce Caton. 16,922 pages, Harper and Rowe. Then it says price, $116. <laughs> now, you know, nine guys are not going to buy that. Even his mother is going to try to get a promotion copy. <laughs> so they got nine pages of this jazz, you know, and, and, and right at the beginning, you can tell he's faking it. It starts out, it says, we all know that Sherman said war is hell. That reminds me of a story. <laughs> And he goes on and on. You read this whole thing, and down at the bottom it says, Bruce Canton's new collection of memorabilia about the Civil War is 10,000 pages long. 
That's all he's mentioned. It. That is a fake. Now, I learned how to do this. I used to go into the library. See, we had this book report list. One list said recommended books. The other list said required books. And that was bad news. I mean, the required books, you know. And I used, to, I used to figure out what required books, and there would be about five books that you could choose from, you know, like War and Peace. War and Peace. They would say, War and Peace, and I would look and see how many pages it had. I would go in, we had this library named Miss Easter, and I would say, uh, how many pages does War and Peace have? She says, it's too long. <laughs> okay. There was always a, I, I, I had another rule. Any book written by an Italian or a Russian, forget. And, and in second place, anything written by a Frenchman was bad news. And so I would take the books and I would weigh them, see. So, you know, I would, really would, see. And I would take, invariably, I would, now wait a minute, a true fake invariably picks the fattest one. Because he recognizes that the teacher faked it too. <laughs> he knows she didn't read this jazz, you know. I mean, like the collected works of Jane Austen. <laughs> Have you ever tried to read Northanger Abbey? I mean, in a world of Jack Willem Suzanne's. I used to take them, see, and then I would do this. I would go way in the back about chapter 36, and there's always a quotation that says, wherein our hero makes a buxom maid on his trip towards Canterbury. Then I'd look back and it says, the abbess said to the abbey, quote, shall we make the nightingale sing for soup? <laughs> I'd say, it's a book about birds. <laughs> That was the time I really got picked up, I'll tell you. <laughs> I wrote a fantastic book review. <laughs> my, I'm not kidding you. My, my mother and father had this book that they kept in their bedroom, see? And it was about, it was about this Italian. <laughs> you know, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm, I'm writing things like a uh, book review on Peter Cottontail. <laughs> And, and I was fantastically in love with this one teacher, Miss Nelson. And, and, and I remember Miss Nelson and Miss Breifogel used to get together, these two teachers. And I figured that if I made Miss Breifogel like me, she would say something nice to Miss Nelson. Now, Miss Breifogel was the teacher that was giving us these book assignments. And she, had, she looked a little bit like, in case you're interested, she looked a little bit like... Did you ever see in the old movies, Edna May Oliver? Well, Miss Breifogel was always saying, boys and girls. We'd sit back there, you know, me and Schwartz, Flick, Bruner. And she was nearsighted. And she says, boys and girls, I would like to instill in you the spirit of good literature that a man who has learned to read and to enjoy the treasures of the past. is a man who is infinitely rich. You know, and I lived in a home where the only reading was the sport page of the Chicago Trib. <laughs> My father also read Fu Manchu. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he used to read things like The Claw, you know, The Yellow Menace. He would wear, you know, things like The Purple Mask of Fu Manchu. We had a whole collection of this stuff, and that's what I thought were books. But there was one book, and this was kept in their bedroom. And I got the idea that the reason this book was kept in their bedroom was because it was such a good book. And it was thick and green. And once in a while, on a Saturday afternoon, I would sneak in when nobody was in the house. You know that feeling of being in a clandestine room that doesn't belong to you? How many times have you had this feeling when you're visiting people 
And, you know, you say to them, uh, excuse me, where is it? They say, up at the head of the stairs and turn left. And you go, and now you're by yourself. You open up this place, and there is this private room. And you're washing your hands. <laughs> and there is this medicine cabinet. <laughs> Are there any secret medicine cabinet voyeurs with us tonight? <laughs> you know, you open up the medicine cabinet. It says, in case of fit, which one has fits? <laughs> oh, wow, you know. And downstairs, you can hear the people, their voices coming up from the air shaft. And you're up there discovering the inner secrets. Well, I'm in this bedroom, see. And you know that feeling, that excitement? She feels she shouldn't be here tonight. You know that feeling, see? And I get in the bedroom. I'm looking around, see? And there's the book. The book. And I pick it up. It's Saturday afternoon. My mother is off with Mrs. Bruner, and they go gone to the movies. My old man is working. My kid brother is off at a birthday party. He was always going to birthday parties. I got this thing, see? I sit down. I start looking at it. It's about Italians. It's got pictures in it. Oh, what is this? Wherein the young maiden from Padua decides that the Abbey bells were made for ringing, for soup. In the fall of the year, it came upon the young woman of Padua who traversed on a journey to... What is this? I couldn't figure out what the word cuckold meant. I said, this is about birds. <laughs> and then it hit me. I will make a book report on this. <laughs> I mean, it's a book by Italians. That's important. It has these illustrations and woodcuts. And all the letters at the beginning of every page were illustrated. You know, great big G with little birds and flowers and all kinds of little leaves hanging off. That automatically means an important book. And so <laughs> for about nine successive Saturdays, I sneak in. You know, and I found out, strangely enough, that I got to like this book. I couldn't figure out why it was. And there was one story about the abbess and the abbey. Well, we had no abbesses in our neighborhood. And I thought vaguely it had something to do with bad teeth. Not kidding, you know. You know so, so I thought, that's a very interesting story. And, I, and, and like an, a real good fake, I'll tell you, a really good book report fake never reads the whole book. He goes through and he picks an obscure passage on page 732. And he says, in the following passage, where William Styron makes the point that the early slave economy was based on the multiplicity of the horticultural areas in which he worked, I take great issue with this. <laughs> in my considered experience, and quoting in this case Truman Capote, <laughs> I mean, this blabber goes on and on. I mean, have you ever wondered how a book reviewer, like say, oh, I can name five of them, no more than name of them, how they can read 34 books in one week? They appear in the holiday, they appear in the times, the New York Review of Books, and they've read all the books. Now, most of us take a good seven weeks to even get past the third page. What are these guys, supermen? Well, they're not. They're just good cheaters, good fakes. And I, speaking of fakes, friends, what radio station is this? <laughs> and speaking of the biggest fake of all, what fun city is this? 
I might as well add right now, since it is uh, 31 minutes past 11, just six minutes ago, the sanitation department began to <laughs> tow your cars away. See, about the abbess and the abbey, and this cuckold. Well, I knew, you know, I had known the phrase, because once in a while, uh, I remember, well, of course, y y words are tricky things. Now, I had a considerable literary background. I mean, I read uh, Mrs. Boggs in the Turnip Patch. <laughs> that was a good book. Although I always thought that Mrs. Boggs had something going on his side she never talked about. And that poor old lady in the shoe. It's too bad she didn't discover modern science. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, it's not easy to live in a shoe with all that going on, too. So I'm reading all this stuff, and I've got a big background of this kind of literature. And I sit down at home, and I decide on this Friday night that I've got to write this book report, see? As so I start to write it. Now, in those days, my literary style had not yet coalesced in its current obscure fashion and diverse circuitousness. In those days, it was direct. I remember writing, this is a good book. <laughs> Anybody who reads this book will enjoy it. That's a good way to fake right there, you know. It is written by an Italian. They write good books. <laughs> it is about an abbess and an abbey, and they pursue a yellow speckled throated cuckold. <laughs> books about birds are good books. <laughs> it was written by a man named B O C C. <laughs> A, look on the back, C C I A C C I O C C O A I. Boccaccio. I like this book. I would recommend it to anybody in the class. Now I will score with Miss Freifolk. Well. <laughs> Everybody hands in their book reports, and I'm real proud. I got this big, thick book about Italians. You know, Schwartz has written, you know, something about, like, Uncle Wiggly, you know. <laughs> Sam the Young Shortstop comes from Flick. I hand in this thing about Boccaccio's The Camerot. Well, two days later, two days later, Miss Freifogel is handing back the book reports. You know that feeling when they're coming back? And they all come back, see, and I hand it back, and there's no book report for me. I look, and Miss Breifogel says, I want Jean Shepard to remain after class. I said, well, I have really scored. Because she is going to tell me about what a beautiful book that I have written about. This is fantastic. Now I can stand and look at my beloved close up and we can discuss Miss Nelson well five minutes after class I'm sitting there all by myself and she calls me up in front you know how teachers sit at the desk have you ever have you ever had this, this morbid curiosity about teachers desk what do they got in there you know, if, if uh, Miss Shields, for example, I knew had over 75 pairs of wax teeth. <laughs> you know, she had more rubber daggers, you know, all that stuff. And I stand up in front of Miss Nelson, Miss Breitfeld, and she looks at me and she says, Jean, that was a very interesting book, you wrote a book review on. Where did you get it? I sense trouble. <laughs> you know, because, oh yeah, we always sense trouble. We're very much creatures of instinct. And like a kid, instantly senses trouble. So a little bell went up, just play it cool. I said, uh, 
Where did I get it? Uh, shall I tell him I took it in my mother's bedroom? Shall I tell her Miss Easter gave it to me? Something said no. I said to her, well, a kid gave it to me. She says, a kid gave it to you? Yeah. Where did you meet this kid? And the way she said it, it said bad news. I mean, I'm not going to say Schwartz. You know, because, you know, she'd have Schwartz in there in a second. So I said, uh, well, uh, usually, you see, I have this quick, fantastic wit. And in my usual quick wit, I said, uh, by the paint sign. He was over by the paint sign. Oh, a kid gave you this book by the paint sign. Do you know who this kid was? He was from George Rogers Clark. And that was the rotten school. Any evil was always ascribed to a kid from George Rogers Clark. I mean, that was at school about nine blocks away. I went to the Warren G. Harding School. You know, isn't that a great name? <laughs> I mean, I'll bet, I'll, you know, I, I always feel that guys have become successes by the things that surround them in early infancy. Like kids that go to the George Washington School. You know? I mean, they go on to become Johnny Carson. I mean, he didn't go to the Warren G. Harding School. I, mean, I remember our coat of arms. It was this teapot dome. <laughs> that dollar signs in gold ripping out of it, you know? <laughs> Underneath it, it said, In hoc et curium et spittle lauk. <laughs> means give it to them, you know, when they're moving. And so as a kid, you know, I, I instantly detected this trouble. I said, you're a kid from George Rogers Clark. She says, oh. Uh, Jean, do you know what a cuckold is? A bird. <laughs> she smiled. She says, yes, that's correct. <laughs> she said, that is correct. And uh, just tell me where you got the book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, did, you didn't get it from a boy? standing next to the Sherwin-Williams paint sign? Yeah. She says, oh, you did? Yeah. Then our kids, yeah. She says, what is an abbess? You know what an abbess is? When you get a hole in your tooth. <laughs> I thought so. That's correct. She said, what do you say I send a note home? <laughs> that is a dreaded, that is the most dreaded word that come out of a human being's mouth. I'm going to send a note home. I mean, I wonder how that would work at the office today. <laughs> among a lot of guys, you know. I could see Charlie Bullard coming back, you know, from the sales meeting. He's worn his credit card down so it's transparent, you know. He's trailing ladies' underwear, you know. He comes walking into the boss's office. He's, I'm going to send a note home to Agnes. <laughs> well, you know, that note home business. She says, would you care if I sent a note home? She says, 
Did you get that book at home? Well, by now, I had gotten the opinion, the idea through this, this mass of cottage cheese that I had between my ears in those days. Now it's a bowling ball. <laughs> Just solidify it a little bit. I got the idea that this was a bad book. Do you admit your mother's got a bad book in her bedroom? These are life's dilemmas. These are the things that produce great symphonies. I mean, I wonder what happened to Beethoven in second grade. I'm standing there. She says, okay. She says, Jeannie. And I knew I was home free then. Whenever she put the I-E on the end, you know, that's like Donnie, Bobby. She says, Jeannie, that is a very good book. And someday, maybe you'll be ready to read it. Yeah. Is that true? She says, yes. I said, okay. She says, now you go on out, and the next time you make a book report, I want you to, how about Sam the Young Shortstop? <laughs> so I'm out, in the, out and instantly I'm out in the schoolyard now, see, with a totally new evaluation of this book. <laughs> I could hardly wait to get home. <laughs> you know? And, and it's very funny about this thing. For years, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm a grown-up kid, see, and I'm in, in college, and I read the paperback version of Boccaccio's The Cameron Knights. And I keep thinking of my mother. You know, and I began to re-evaluate her. <laughs> you know, up to this point, I thought my mother and father, you know, they talked about uh, Tarzan and Jane. You know, about Luke Gapley, the White Sox. And for years and years, my mother and I never once mentioned this green book that was in her bedroom until after the war. I come home, you know, and I'm an ex-GI, and I have been everywhere. I mean, I saw stuff written on walls in languages that have not even been discovered yet. In fact, I saw a guy write a fantastic word using a Thompson submachine gun. <laughs> I'm not kidding, that's creativity. Wait till Jim Dine discovers that. I mean, really, this guy went up to the side of a barn and he went, gah, 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 And it's going, gah, 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 You know? He just left two letters of the word. He didn't have to finish it, you know. Not in that army, you know. They put about three dotted lines after. Gah, 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 gah. Then he went, gah, 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 Great big exclamation point. I mean, and those shells were like 17 cents a piece. You know? And I remember the second lieutenant coming along, Lieutenant Cherry, and he sees it. It's only two letters. He says, who's done that? Didn't I tell this platoon that any time they start something, they finish it, huh? <laughs> Up gets Gasser with his machine gun. He goes, gah, 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 gah. <laughs> The lieutenant says, let me put the final word in there. And so, you know, there's all kinds of creativity. So I had seen a lot of stuff, you know. I really had. So I came home, you know, I'm all hairy. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. You know, that's a GI word, see? And I got back off the boat, and I came home, and I got my, I got my tin hat, you know, all this stuff. I got seven barracks bags on. 
I come swinging into the kitchen. It's the first minute home. The wire returns. And I put that barracks back down. What do I? My mother's hanging over the sink. She's wearing her rump sprung chenille bathrobe with Chinese red. You know, and I walked in, I'm a GI, and I go, Patui! She looks up. I'm home, Ma. Do you want something to eat? Yeah. This is the first five minutes I'm in the, in the home, you know, from coming back. You, ex you know these great scenes that they always show in the movies of people running towards each other with outstretched arms? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I mean, you know, I kept saying this. This is a, mag a magnificent moment. Remember it. So I sit down. She's up there looking into the sink. The sink is going... <laughs> the coffee grounds come up. Apple core, you know, the fish head. I see through the kitchen window across the driveway, Mrs. Bruner. She's hanging over her sink. She's stuffing the coffee grounds in. They're coming up out of our sink. My mother starts to stuff potato peelings down. I see Mrs. Bruner look up. Oh, yeah, we traded plumbing all over our neighborhood. You know those terrible moments? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it. Oh, man, that isn't the only kind of plumbing we traded. Oh, I don't want to tell you. I remember when the whole neighborhood, all... How do I say this on the radio? When the entire neighborhood, all of them at once, got stopped up and overflowed. You could hear screams for blocks around. And the only one that didn't scream was Mr. Bruner. Because he started it all. <laughs> you know, it's come up. Oh, it's, it's life, you know. And so I'm, 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 I'm home from the Army the first five minutes in. I sit down. Three years. You know, and I expected my mother to say something like, Faye Bainter. You know how Faye Bainter always talked to Andy Rooney when he came home? You know, or Van Johnson? My mother turns around and says, take out the garbage. <laughs> I'm right back! Three years I worked. So I pick up the garbage, out and back I go, and I see four doors down, and this was one of the best moments of my life. There was a guy in our neighborhood named Jack Morton. And every two weeks, I'd get a letter from home from my mother telling me about Jack Morton, who is now a lieutenant in the Air Force. Now, he's only been in three weeks. And he's only 12. <laughs> now, he is a first lieutenant in the Air Force. Now he is a captain in the Air Force. My mother would always say, I can't understand why you are still a PFC. <laughs> well, I did. I understood it. I mean, you know, and I, 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 and I never would have figured Jack Morton to be the guy. In our neighborhood, there's always about nine guys, you know, that are choosing up sides. And, you know, these are guys that can play second base, that can hit guys. And me and Flick and Schwartz, we were always choosing up, you know. And down at the end of the line, there were always this little rubble of kids. Among them, Jack Morton. <laughs> you know, he had these protruding teeth and all that little, he weighed 104 pounds at the age of 17. Jack Morton. And now he is a colonel. I had gotten a final letter that says he's now a lieutenant colonel. And I had worked my way up in three years to T-5. Now, I don't know whether you know what a T-5 is. You've all heard of a corporal. 
Well, a T5 is a corporal with a T under it. That means that they've made him corporal, but they don't trust him. <laughs> yeah, that's really what it means, you know. They, 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 he gets no command whatsoever. I mean, they figure he's been in the Army three years, he's fixed 4,000 radar sets, you know, he's done all this stuff, let's give him a little bone. And so you get these two little stripes with a T, which means actually very, very temporary. So I'm a T5, and I'm proud of it. And I get that letter and it says, Jack Morton is now a colonel. Well, I'm out in the backyard and it's dusk. We have just returned. I am, you know, the whole new world is spreading out before me in all of its pristine glory. I am about to go to college. I am about to learn what the world is about, to become a professional man. Who knows what lies ahead? And I'm out in the backyard putting the garbage down. And I see in the dusk, I see this guy four doors down. He comes out with a bag of potato peelings and apple cores. And I look down, and it is Jack Morton. Colonel Jack Morton. He's got a bag of garbage. He's putting it away. And I'm still wearing my uniform, you know, with a T5 stripes. And I see a glint of silver. And I say, hey, Jack! And he looks up. Yes? Somehow, I would like to tell you that I put him down. I would like to tell you this, but I have to be truthful. I got my bag of coffee grounds, and I got this dead fish, and I got these cans of salmon that have been saved for me to take out. <laughs> and down there is Jack Morton standing here with the two little silver things. And he says, yes. I said, hey, Jack. Sir? <laughs> He says, yes, Corporal. I said, yes, sir. He says, may I help you with your garbage, sir? He says, no, that's all right. I'm off duty. <laughs> I would like to report to you guys that Jack Morton is now selling shoes in the Tom McCann shop in Griffith, Ohio. He is not. Jack Morton is in the news every day. In fact, he is in the news practically hourly. He is a great captain of industry. And my mother keeps writing me. In fact, not more than three days ago. Do you know last Wednesday, I got a letter from my mother, and she said, when are you getting a job? <laughs> How can you explain it? She sat here one night through the entire show in the limelight. I'm telling you, the only time she ever saw me work, she sat up on the shelf there. And she sat up there seeing all these people were around there. And they kept laughing. And she kept saying, well, that's the way it really was. <laughs> she didn't laugh once. <laughs> she sees nothing funny in a chenille bathrobe. You know, and after the show was over, and I came over, and I said, how did you like it, Ma? <laughs> she says, you know, I worry about you. <laughs> said, what do you mean, Ma? She says, when are you going to get a job? She put it in perspective. I mean, that's an evil thing, to put something into perspective. And so I came back from the Army that night, and I looked at my mother hanging over the sink, and I thought of Boccaccio's Decameron. You thought I'd lost it, didn't you? I thought of Boccaccio's Decameron. But there she is hanging over the sink, see? She puts down in front of me a plate with red cabbage, a plate with mashed potatoes, you know, the whole thing with the meatloaf. And she says, here, have something to eat. This was my first post-war meal. And without thinking, I says, give me the fried out salt.
There's a word that is used in the Army to describe the salt. <laughs> it's also used to describe the milk, the bread. <laughs> the CO. It's used to describe the sky, the birds, everything. That's a why, you know, it's a universal word. It's like silly putty, you know, you know. It's like breathing. You don't think of breathing. How often have you said, gee, I'm breathing? <sighs> you know, it just comes out of you. So I, I said, give me the put up salt. My mother turns around and says, here's the put up salt. <laughs> well, she went back over the sink. You know, I'm eating away there, I'm scrapping, you know, down, and it didn't hit me what she had said. I was so used to this word, I didn't hear it anymore. I'm scrapping away, and all of a sudden it hit me. Did she say it, or did I? I must have said it. I have to watch it. It is the post-war world. I have to be careful of what I say and what I do. My mother's over there with the sink, you know, and she's putting the dishes in there and she's washing the stuff. I looked up at her. I said, uh, Mom, <laughs> Ma, um, did I just say something? She turned. I said, why not? You asked for the salt. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Am I imagining it? Did I, did I say it or didn't I say it? Well, I'm sitting there about two minutes later, and we're in a conversation. And without thinking, I said, Hey, Ma, you got any bottle of beer? I knew I said it. I caught it halfway out. You know? And I invented one of those words that Norman Mailer invents. You know, for the novels. My mother turns around says, It's in the Baba refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, Ma. <laughs> I go back, I open the refrigerator, and there's our usual, everything is the same. Nothing had changed. Three years. I open the thing, and out comes the lettuce. <laughs> We had this brown lettuce that was in our refrigerator for as long as I remember. Every time you'd open it, it would hit your foot. The old man would drop kick it, you know? And, and, and we always had, next to it, we had this plate of used peas with a rim of, of solidified grease. My mother always kept in, the, you know, she kept in the, in case somebody wanted a little snack. And now they were petrified and they had hair on them, you know. And she also kept in there, we always had a hamburger with one bite out of it. A hamburger patty, you know, and it had the great grease around it. So I opened it up, there's the symphony of my whole life. And I turned to my mom and I said, Mother, How about Boccaccio's Decameron? And she turned. She says, wasn't that the greatest Baba book you ever read? <laughs> Let's give her a hand. All right, gang. We'll be back next week at the same time. Hang in there. Keep your knees loose. And think clean thoughts. It'll work out all right. Here is a...